Hi, I'm Jeff Brown. Hi, I'm Ross Bentley. And this is No Dumb this Questions. No Dumb Questions. Hey, we timed that perfectly, didn't we? <laughs> oh, man, I mean, uh, we only practiced it 100 times. You figure we got, we should get it right by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you've, uh, if, if you're listening to this, my, one of my favorite podcasts to listen to is a, is a podcast called No Stupid Questions with Stephen Dubner and Ange- Angela Duckworth. And I really love that podcast that podcast. And I don't know, it was a few months ago, Jeff, you and I were somewhere, I think, and we, and we kind of started talking about doing something like that because every now and then we get somebody that asks, well, I'm not going to say a dumb question because none of them are dumb, but we get a question and it's like, how are we going to answer that? And we've joked around and had some fun with some ideas of how to answer them. And we thought, what the heck, let's do a podcast like this, right? Yeah, I think it sounds great because we get questions all the time and most of those that people think are dumb. Hey, I got a dumb question. It's actually makes me and I'm sure you too kind of go, well, that's a pretty good question. That's not dumb at all. I got to give that some thought. So, well, and it seems like every time somebody says I've got a dumb question, by the time I finish answering it, I've actually gotten smarter. Uh, me so, too. So, so, I guess this is for us, not for the people listening then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, we're in racing because so we must be the most selfish people in the world, so it's all about us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> By definition. Yeah. And, and I guess the one other thing, just to warn people, I guess, is we are not promising to answer your questions <laughs> because we right. may just read your question and go, oh, yeah, let's talk about something else because we got something on our mind. So we may <laughs> or we might just veer off a little way. So you just said we're selfish. We're doing this for us. So yeah. it's got to be fun for us. And hopefully uh, other people get something from it, too. But yeah, yeah it's going to be un- unscripted and just. Um, uh, just us talking with some good, uh, good prodding by some questions from everybody out there. And I can't think of anybody that I'd rather do this with than you, Jeff. But just uh, uh, we've known each other since 1993, 94, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that's a long time ago, Ross. <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember Colin and Travis were this tall. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That would have yeah. been, yeah, three and four year olds about that time. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to start by asking you a question and right. we'll kind of flip this around a little bit. We're going to cover all sorts of topics, but the first question comes from Travis. And the question is this, how do you find the best way to approach the situation where the faster setup is not what makes the driver most comfortable, i.e. the driver or the car isn't good, but the stopwatch shows otherwise? Good question. And I think we'll start off right away with changing that question a little bit. Of course. Because, of course. Because it's a good it's a great question, but really I'm I try to think back to the number of times that that's happened to me and it's almost zero. Almost always the most comfortable setup, the driver drives it the fastest. Now, uh, yeah, it isn't exactly zero. I mean, I've had drivers who have gone faster in a setup and say, ooh, yeah, so that's a little faster, but I couldn't drive that for a full stint. I can do it for qualifying. Right. And that kind of defines like a qualifying setup. We're like, yeah, for when the tires are good, I can hang on for two or three laps like that, but, but I'm not comfortable to do a full stint. Normally, if, if I'm kind of getting Travis's question right, it, it's more like, hey, the stop, the driver comes in and says, ooh, I don't like that setup. It's not comfortable. I can't drive it very good. And then you say, but you're faster that way. That, I don't think that happens too much um, because what I find is if a driver is comfortable and he likes how the car is handling, you know, comfortable by definition is it's doing what he expects it to do turns into the corner, it does what he wants it to do, puts on the brake, it does. It, it's not surprising him and he's it's telegraphing what he wants it to do. It's comfortable. And generally that's when drivers get the most out of the car and go the quickest because they can bring their driving talent to the forefront. They're not battling the car all the time. So I think it's a rare case, but if if I were going into an endurance race and it's the driver said, hey, I'm not comfortable with that, but I think it's a little quicker. I would probably have to change the setup because it's going to catch him out. He's going to get it wrong. He's going to 
whatever's not comfortable about it, whether it's the brakes or it turns in too sharp or whatever, traffic's going to hit and he's going to end up making a, you know, somebody's going to do something in front of him that's going to surprise him. And if he's not comfortable with it, he's going to ruin the car, make a mistake. Well, what if though, like deep down inside, you know that it's quicker and maybe it's a, well, the driver's got to figure out a way to, to get comfortable with it. Like, you know, get used to it. it yeah. Just, just yeah. Work. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, that can happen. I suppose again, quicker, uh, you know, if it was quicker for a, a short period of time, I would say just suck it up and do it. You know, we're qualifying here. We got to get the pole or whatever, suck it up and do it. Or I can kind of maybe help him. He, he might say, man, it's just not comfortable. And I'd say, well, you're on like, full stint tires and kind of half tanks. You're never going to be in that situation. You'll be on full stint tires and light tanks. It's going to feel better. And maybe I'm just trying to convince him that it's going to get more comfortable. But I mean, in in the real world, you know, hey, we'll put new tires on it. It'll be better. I don't have time to give you a shot at that right now. It'll get better. You'll be more comfortable. Um, So I I don't know. and, And it comes down to driver confidence, right? Exactly. Because the driver's not confident, I guarantee you will be slow. And that's why I say, if the driver doesn't have confidence, usually they're slow. It doesn't show up on the stopwatch. But, you know, Travis has obviously had this situation arise because that's why he asked the question. So if it's most drivers, most pro guys will say, yeah, that's it's knife edgy and not easy to drive and not much fun. But I saw my lap time. so." let's go we'll keep it and they'll they'll deal with it the pros will they probably will say yeah kids there's something we can do to tone it down for a long run or you know in the night or something like that but if it's quicker by 0.001 seconds almost every driver is going to want that and then like you said maybe you can figure out some ways to drive around it you can get with his driver coach he can look at the data and figure out a way maybe to get more comfortable with that little more knife edgy setup well a couple of things i mean you and i have worked together in situations where you're engineer and i'm driver coach and i think we've had this experience before where as a coach i mean i've gone to an engineer you or another engineer at times and said uh leave the car alone let me work with the driver for a little bit and see if we can figure out some ways to build confidence and so there's you know if you've got if, if you have the advantage of of having that but the second part of that is I'd say, you know, one of the things that I've observed with you as an engineer is you, you always default to the driver. Well, maybe not always, but, you know, I've worked with engineers who the default is whatever the computer says. And I think your attitude is different. Yes, because to me, it's always been uh, I've had the luxury of working with some world-class drivers. And I've always found that if I can give them what they want, what they need, what they expect the car to do, they will go faster than if it's not doing what they expect it to do. So they're talented drivers, right? They can, but if I give them what they want, what they expect, give them a setup that's just super confidence inspiring, they can bring out all of that great talent. And so for me, I've always found that the faster setup on the simulation or the data or something like that oftentimes isn't faster because you have to, you have a human behind there. And and you really learn that when you run endurance racing and you have two, three, four drivers in some races, because the same setup does not produce the same lap time. And I'm not talking with amateur versus pro drivers. I'm talking take three world-class pros, which I've had the luxury of having quite often. And I mean, guys who are like, you talk to 10 people and you'll get different answers of which one of the three is the best, but they'll all be in their top people's top three. And they'll, they'll have different ideas on what the setup should be and what they can go fastest with. So for me, it's never been really that data fast setup that's most important. So, so, you know, you've, you've had guys like 
uh, Ryan Underray, uh, Michele yep. Alboreto, Fermin Velez, uh, uh, Marino Franchitti. I mean, you've had guys like that. Right. Do they, I mean, uh, same kind of deal? Like, I guess, can you push them farther and say, well, okay, it's a little uncomfortable, but drive it versus yes. a gentleman driver, uh, you know, in, in that same situation where you got to be a little bit more um, comforting. Exactly. And most of the time, those drivers, those pro guys, um, you know, most uh, recently I had uh, Roma Duma, Wojt Duval, Colin, and John Bennett. So there's a good example. You have three really good world-class pros. They all defaulted to let's make the car comfortable for John because yeah. they knew that, okay, maybe they could get another tenth out of it if it was a little different, but they knew that if it was good for John, John was going to be less likely to make a mistake. And those guys would all, they would all want a slightly different setup for what they could ultimately get out of the car. And it was not what the data said. It was not what the simulation said. It was, it was slightly different based on their driving style. I mean, they could all get the same lap time out of it, but they would do it slightly differently um what one guy thought was like oh this is uncomfortable knife edgy the other guy was like no this is pretty comfortable you can make it more knife edgy and i'll go faster and so to me tuning it to the driver and getting him you know travis said <clears throat> most comfortable to me that's the key is most comfortable not the setup that is quote the fastest however you define that to me the fastest setup is the one that's most comfortable so the driver can extract the most out of the car so here's a uh it, this kind of, this question kind of triggered a a memory of of coaching uh, and i've done this many times but i'm coaching a driver and i can specifically think of one particular car one particular driver and we were at vir and they were going down to second gear for turn three, um, the left-hander called NASCAR turn there, as yep. well as the top of the roller coaster turn 13 down before you go down the hill. They were going to second gear. And I said, run those corners in third gear. And they ran a bunch of laps in third gear and they come into the pits and said, see, it doesn't work. And I go, no, look at the lap time. You were like three quarters of a second faster. And you know, sometimes that second gear, it sounded great. You know, the engines revving, they're coming out of there and they were like, it can feel a car really squirt out of the corners, yep. but they were over slow in the car. What about that situation? Because that's, you know, the driver felt more comfortable in second gear, but they were slower. Well, that's where, you know, you, it, that's where as an engineer, having the luxury of a driver coach like you, you, you know, you would say, don't touch the car a lot of times. And I would come to you, Ross, at times and say, do I need to change this? Because if I change it, I think it'll ultimately be slower. He might be more comfortable, but he might be slower. If you can help him understand that if he did this or this, use third gear in that corner, it would actually be better. And we can work together because I'll oftentimes tell my driver, okay, I get it. I can make it more comfortable if you do, if I do this, but it's going to be potentially slower if you can adjust to this somehow figure it out by yourself or if you have a, a driver coach work together with him you will ultimately go quicker it's, it's a, a good a good quick example is springs a lot of drivers will like super stiff springs because the car doesn't move around and they feel more comfortable because they don't feel this movement and it's really has a good platform yet i know they're giving up grip and if they can deal with a car that moves a little bit more, they're going to make more grip in certain situations on certain tracks with certain surfaces and go quicker. So there's, you know, maybe I've talked myself in a complete circle. Where I said there is no faster setup. Maybe there is. And if the driver will just deal with it, you know, I will tell them, look, I'll do what's most comfortable. But if you can figure out a way to drive this other setup and be comfortable with it, you'll go faster. Yeah, remember uh, remember when we were working with a driver in a Ferrari Challenge car at Laguna Seca a number of years ago? Oh, yeah. And one of the little exercises that I like to do with drivers, you like to do with drivers, is do like a big sweep on tire pressures. And 
you know, I remember we had this conversation of well, let's mm-hmm. go up on the tire pressures. And you said, let's go up. I don't know. I think it was like six PSI. And I was kind of like, whoa, that's a big wow. change. Right. Well, this driver, I mean, six PSI from a tire pressure sitting that you had run like a gazillion laps in Ferrari challenge cars. Right. right. You knew that that was the right tire pressure, but you went up to six and the driver went faster. Right. And it was, I, we figured out that it was just the car felt so responsive with no sidewall flex and everything. Yes, it was losing grip, but it was so responsive that the driver actually went faster. And that was a case right. of, you know, I think we both kind of looked at each other and said, well, I guess we kind of got to work with that for a while, but we need to gradually wean the driver off of those, those tire pressures and bring them back into line where they're going to have more grip. Because we knew, but, but it taught us something about what that driver defined comfortable as. So then I went back and thought, okay, well, we can't run those tire pressures because they'll go higher, higher, they'll climb crazy and they'll lose grip and later in a run and all that. But we know what he likes. So that tells me what's going to make him comfortable. So maybe I can do stiffer springs, stiffer bars, stiffer whatever. Oh, and you as a coach went, hey, if Jeff can't do those things because it's going to lose cost of grip, maybe driver, you can figure out a way to get more comfortable with the car moving a little bit and you'll go quicker. And that's where having a driver coach like you really makes it easy and, or a driver who's open to that stuff and open to that kind of feedback. Some, some aren't. Yeah. Okay. So one last part of this thing, and then we'll move on to another question here, but uh, this is so interesting because I think, you know, again, one of the, one of the things that I've noticed in the way you engineer is you're very, um, sensitive to the driver's feedback and some engineers are less sensitive to that you you drove you raced you you have that background and some engineers have some of that and some have less of that uh you know i'd like to think that because i've done a little tiny little i don't even want to call what i've done engineering because my engineering tuning of race cars uh you've lapped me 12 times um in your driving part of it but uh you know i think uh a coach that understands that part of it, what the engineer is going through, an engineer that understands what the driver is going through, uh, I think you're just going to be better at your job, I think. For sure, for sure. And you sell yourself short on the engineering part of it. You understand completely what the engineer is trying to accomplish. You also understand better than almost anybody what the driver is trying to accomplish. And you understand that those are not two separate things. And that's the key to it is to, and that's, if it's a driver without a coach, he needs to be able to work with the engineer and explain what he needs. And the engineer needs to work with him and try to give him what he needs. If you have a driver coach, it just makes it easier because especially a driver's coach sympathetic to the engineer. I've had driver coaches that were just always like, oh, it's the car. You got to change the car. You got to change the car. That doesn't work. But like when you and I work together, it's, it's us trying to work together to get the driver quicker. I mean, that's all that matters. Get them quicker. Yeah. Yeah. I've had that experience of walking into a race team and the engineer looks across and goes, Oh, 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 you know what? Bleep, bleep. A, right. a driver coach is here. A driver coach. <laughs> right. Right. Cause he thinks it's going to make his job harder. It's yeah. Always. You get the right driver coach. It makes your job easier. Way easier. And I'm going to let you know my little secret. The very first thing I do is when I, when I'm in that situation is I'm working with the engineer and the very first time the engineer says, you know, I'm going to make a change or whatever. I'll, I'll go, your change is perfect. You know, it's the driver's fault. Um, (laughs) And and like, we're together on this thing, dude. (laughs) Right. Right. Exactly. I'll fix the driver. You, you do the car how you want. I'll fix the driver for you. Yeah. yeah. The the good thing about it is I know how that works. Engineers, they just want the car to go faster too. If you tweak the driver and make the car go faster, he his his car went faster. So he's like, yeah, all right. This is uh, another tool that he can use to make his car go faster. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. All right. Well, I don't know if that answered um, a- a- answered Travis's question or not, but uh, anyway, confidence important important thing. And stopwatch playing both the stopwatch and the driver's confidence and comfortableness is pretty important. All right, I got a question for you then. Okay, <clears throat> is it hard? Uh, yes. Well, the 
quote of a, a guy who I, I like a lot, Alex Honnold. He said, if it was easy, it wouldn't be hard. Ooh, good point. Right? Yeah. So, it easy, so, it wouldn't be, yeah. <laughs> right. So, of course, this one's hard. <laughs> Well, hopefully it's not as hard as uh, climbing El Capitan, right? Or... <laughs> right, right. This, this should be at least safer. Yeah, okay. Um, so we got a question from Kelsey, and um, he said some great things about us and how cool this podcast is going to be. That will will put uh, for to be, de- to be determined, right? Yeah. But after all of that nice stuff, he said, I'm struggling with getting comfortable with high-speed corners and catching the car in a slide in those areas versus low speed corners where I feel confident in catching any catching a slide. Any tips you guys have or exercises that I might be able to work on this. I'm consistently five to 10 miles per hour slower in high speed corners than my co-driver in the same car. And there's a lot of time to be found there. The good thing is, is that we've got four hours to answer that question, right? Uh, Yes. Yes. And, it sounds like we're going to need some high speed corners and lots of cars because we might ruin some. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that, yeah, that's the best way. Just go start to- tossing the cars off the track and figuring out where that where it goes. Um, right. Maybe if it bad. doesn't stick, we try something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a, a number of things come to mind when when I hear that question. And, and you know, one, one of them is skid pad time. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a paved skid pad. You know, we've had drivers, you know, go to Dirtfish Rally School and play in the dirt and slide cars around the dirt, getting used to the car moving more. And that helps. And it helps uh, sort of build some programming around how to respond to the car sliding that then leads to confidence. Same thing we were just talking about with setups kind of stuff. You know, it all comes down to, in fact, um, Kelsey actually even talks about, you know, feeling confident and catching it in slow corners, but not in fast corners. Well, why not? You know, I mean, one of the one of the reasons probably is I'm going to say most tracks have more slow corners and medium speed corners than they do really fast corners. So you just get more experience and more time on those slower medium speed corners than you do in real fast ones. But if you go and spend some time on a skid pad, sliding a car around, you do get more confidence there. However, you know, skid pads and even like loose surface, dirt, mud, gravel, that kind of stuff, everything's happening in slow motion in relation to what happens in a fast corner on the track. So that can only go so far. I would say that, you know, if you're, what was it, five, 10 miles an hour slower, I think a skid pad is going to make a difference. Yes, absolutely. I think a skid pad or a skid training of some type will make a difference. And, you know, I just worked um, with Nick Romano at a, at a, he's got a program fast sideways it, that he does programs in California. I've also done work with uh, Johan Schwartz at, uh, he does skid training stuff um, back at the Performance Center in, in South Carolina. And, you know, there are different people around the country that if somebody calls me up and says, who do I go to? Um, I kind of point them in different directions. Now I'm just, my phone's going to be ringing tomorrow with uh, everybody <laughs> asking me that question. But, but you know, so I, I do think the skid pad thing is, it's almost like that's the very first step. Get some more time, just getting more comfortable with that. Yep. Let me ask you a quick, let me butt in here. Skid yep. pad, uh, we're diverting a little bit, but that's what we do. Yep. Um, so I've had drivers who, probably needed that same kind of thing as Kelsey's describing here but a lot of tracks don't have skid pads and you that's like they're like okay I'm going to a WRO race or I'm going to a champ car race and I got 14 hours but there's I can't go out on a skid pad can you practice those things the same kind of thing in slow corners on a racetrack I mean you don't want to spin out during the race or anything but can you can you get some of that feel in a slow corner on a racetrack or a couple slow corners every lap and kind of work on it that way or no? Yes. In fact, I think that's a really good point in that, hey, if you're okay doing it in a slow corner, you're okay doing it in a fast corner. You think that the consequences are higher. You know, it's that whole thing of, you know, if I put a, if I put a, a two by six and lay it on the ground and say, walk along the length of that two by six, you'd have no problem doing that. If I took that same two by six and 
and put it between two things that are 15 feet in the air and said, walk along on top of that, you'd be a little bit more, uh, put it yeah. between two 10 story buildings and you'd say, no way would I ever do that. Well, it's the same kind right. of thing. It's, it's exactly the same. So if you can do it in slow corners, you can do it in fast corners. You know, from a technique perspective, the, the biggest thing that I see a mistake that people make is, you know, we're taught, you know, smooth is fast, smooth is fast, you know, smooth hands, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that works up until the point where you need to make a correction and then be fast, like catch it. You know, I, I always say like initiate it kind of thing slow, but catch things fast. And, and I think that if you can put that in your mind and program that and visualize doing that, that the car steps out, I'm just going to catch it right now. There really is no difference. Uh, so um, it, it's, it's about, you know, I would say 99% of, of the situation here, Kelsey, is, is not your technique or your skill. It's you believing you have the technique or skill to do it. And, you know, it's very easy for me to sit here and go, well, be confident. There you go. Everything's fixed now. Right. <laughs> right. It, it, it. It's, yeah. I, I think you're really right. The, the whole consequences are, you know, in a slow speed in a, you know, whatever, pick a corner, turn five at Road America, you spin out and you get it wrong. Oop, I carried oh, a little too much speed and oop, you spin out and you collect and you go back up. You know, six corners later, if you do that in the kink, whew, you're in a world of hurt. And yeah. you don't just spin out and, oh, well, learn something there. No, you probably destroyed your car and, and all of that. But it's, it, it, but there has to be a little bit also in a high speed corner, using those two examples, in a 60 mile an hour corner, you have a little bit more time. Your mistake kind of is telegraphed to you over a longer period of time, right? In, in a 150 mile an hour corner, you cover a lot more distance in a hurry and your mistake kind of comes to you quicker, right? Or not? Well, uh, I, I partially agree with you. Like I, I agree that uh, it, the correction needs to be, it needs to happen quicker because you're just, you're, you're traveling faster, you're covering more distance and <laughs> You know, racetracks have a limited amount of distance, right? Right, uh, exactly. But I don't think that it actually gives you more warning in slow corners. I think the warning is the same amount if you're paying attention mm. to it. You know, if you go through a, you know, a 50 mile an hour corner and the car starts to slide, it gives you that same amount of warning as it does in a 90 mile an hour corner. If you're really paying attention to it. And, yep. Yep. and you know, but again, the correction might have to be a little quicker. So I'd say that's about the, you know, from a technique perspective, like I said, I don't think it makes that big a difference. Um, so yeah, the, that, that makes sense. The, the, that makes sense. The, the other thing that, that, that does come to mind is the number of drivers that look up in the sky and go, oh, it's raining. I'm not going out this session. Uh, big mistake. You know, big the, mistake. The, the the best car control training you can ever get is actually on a track in the rain and and especially in a fast corner. You know, I'm thinking of a few years ago, I did a WRL race at Coda and, you know, Coda's got the big carousel that sweeps underneath the, the tower there. And it's a big, long corner. And I just like, this is the coolest corner in the world because I can just drive through there and go, okay, I've got some understeer. Now I got some oversteer. Now I got some understeer. I got some understeer. I got, oh, now I got a little oversteer. And you're just playing with the car all the way through there. And if you kind of, you know, my rule for driving in the rain is make the car do something. So then mm -hmm. you can just deal with it rather than waiting for it to do something to you. And in this case, you know, I'd be driving laps through that corner in the pouring rain and going, this is the greatest training for my ability to sense what the car is doing. Uh, so yeah. actually, I'm going to, and sorry, Jeff, but, but I think, you know, this oh, gets me excited thinking about the rain and that whole <laughs> part of car control. And maybe what it is, Kelsey, is in slow corners, you're okay initiating the car moving. You come into a corner in a slow corner, you know, you come into that corner, you brake hard, you come in there, you trail off the brakes, the car, you know, either starts to understeer or starts to oversteer and you're ready for that. And then you deal with it all the way through the rest of the corner. 
Whereas in a fast corner, you approach it and go, ooh, I'm gonna slow down and come into the corner and now I'm gonna to start to creep up on the limit and you're creeping up to it, creeping up to it, creeping up to it, creeping up, and then it moves and it surprises you. So as counterintuitive or scary, whatever, whatever phrase you wanna use here, as it seems, the best thing you can do with a fast corner is enter it and make the car do something. Like my favorite thing at the carousel at Coda, for example, is to come into that corner on power, turn into the corner and have the car start to understeer. And then it's like, yes, I got this. I know what I've got all the rest of the way through this corner. I can kind of dial some out and bring it back in and maybe it starts to oversteer, but I'm driving the car rather than the drive the car driving me. Does that make sense? Yep, I get yeah, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so now I'm going to throw in one other thing on here. Kelsey didn't say, um, but he talked about high-speed corners versus slow-speed corners. I'll throw this out there. Maybe Kelsey's in a 1980s sliding skirt, full-tunnel downforce Formula <laughs> One car. And, and okay, or maybe he's in an LMP, current LMP2, LMP3, or small formula car where there's some aero effects now in the high speed corner and it's harder to feel right it's either like the drivers will tell you hey it's either stuck to the ground or i'm crashing how do i go fast in a high downforce corner on a slow you know on a a high downforce corner high speed i can't feel it how do i do that well i was going to say boy that sounds like a question for another day <laughs> Because it's a whole other topic right. of driving. Maybe, maybe we should do that. Maybe we yeah. should do that. Uh, you know, like driving cars with massive aero. Uh, you know, and it used to be. I'm going to say it used to be. Uh, used to be more pronounced. Um, you know, I remember when driving like Formula Atlantic car when early Formula Atlantic cars didn't have much, like they didn't have tunnels under them, and then we got. Right. All RT4s with tunnels under them. And all of a sudden it was like big, big difference between non-aero grip and aero grip. And there was just that moment. I can remember the first time I drove one of those cars, it was like, wow, I just got to go five miles an hour faster and the car will stick better. Right. And, and there comes just a, you know, a level of commitment, trust, stupidity, <laughs> some mix of those <laughs> things <laughs> where it says, yep. I'm just going to go faster and I'm going to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, that probably is a whole nother question. It's, yeah. it's, we're, we're assuming Kelsey is in a, in a, what we'll call a low downforce car. Yeah. You know, even like something GT3 or below, like a GT4 or below kind of thing that what you've said, I think all applies to, to that. It's amazing nowadays how much like downforce, even a GT3 car has. I mean, those yeah. are downforce cars and, and that's maybe, yeah, that's a different, different subject and it's probably a different, um, a different answer that gets really, that can get really tricky. You and I did that test with Scott Tucker once trying to figure that out in, in Utah. And I'm not sure we actually figured it out. We sure did scrape a lot of rocks and <laughs> dust and go through a lot of flat spotted tires trying to figure it out though. But I think he actually, he did. He went better after that with you. We went to Lamar and he was the quickest am rated driver in the porsche curves that year at Le Mans over any any other driver and i think that may be one of the one of his, his biggest takes takeaways from Le Mans was actually getting that after working with you there in utah to try to figure out how to be better in high speed corners so another question prop for another day <laughs> yeah and you know and it all comes back to you have to sense when the car is beginning to break away and the biggest difference between the non-aero and the big arrow is that's definitely a case of the big arrow car breaks away quicker. You get less warning. And right. you know, uh, take a take a real extreme example of that is, you know, take a, and that's why we always recommend to people, go get a Miata on skinny little tires and go out and play in that thing until you're used to the car moving around and you get sensitive because those cars and tires give you lots of warning. And then as you move up to stickier tires, they get less and less warning. And then eventually you get into aero cars and you get even less warning, but you've learned how to sense those things and eventually you get there. Yep, yep. that's good. Okay, so you see now we're, we're actually uh, actually increasing the number of questions we have because we're thinking of questions. So we'll do that. Yeah. And, and at some stage. 
at some stage. We'll we'll get into the whole arrow thing, but um, you know, I, I Jeff, I think we we talked that we were going to probably do two questions per episode, but yep. this being the first one, we're going to do a quick bonus one. We're just going to throw in the the last bonus question just because of the time of year. And the question is, and I'm not sure who sent it because it's one of those. It's an Instagram uh, address of Colossal Brace, but uh, the question is. What are you most looking forward to in 2022? You go first. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to be really honest. I'm most looking forward to the fact that people will are continuing to pay me to play with their very expensive race cars, set them up, make them go faster, giving me world-class drivers and crews to work with on that. And they still are willing to pay me to do that in 2022. So that's what I'm looking forward to, getting back to the racetrack and, and trying to win some races in you know, LMP3, IMSA Prototype Challenge, Lamborghini Super Trofeo. I think that may be all I'm doing this year. So I'll try to win some races there and go back to the racetrack, see my friends. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not much new, but it's that I get to keep doing what I love doing in 2022. Well, it's interesting that uh, how many times you and I have talked over the last few years where you say, okay, that this year I'm cutting back. I'm, I'm going to do less. Uh, and, and all, you know, it's not, it's not our, and I've said the same thing. It's not our, uh, we are losing any love for what we do at the track. It's the traveling that requires, that's required to do all that stuff. But, uh, you know, you say you're going to cut back and then you go, okay, I'm going to do, uh, you know, LMP3 and prototype challenge and super true. Right. And you know, blah, 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 blah. You, you can't stop. Can you? <laughs> No, no, I said I'm going to semi-retire and I'm just, uh, I'm the horriblest person at semi-retiring. If, if you need, if you need anybody to help you figure out how to semi-retire, I'm not your guy because I can't, I'm terrible at it. Because you and I have both talked about it and I've said, Jeff, give me some advice on how to do that. And you haven't, can you haven't helped me at all. <laughs> no, 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 we're, we're, we're both afflicted with the same thing. Okay. We're going to, how many airplanes have you, all I see on you with Instagram is pictures of you sitting in airplane seats. That yeah. seems like you're, yeah. So you have the same problem. I know. So yeah. what are you, what, what are you looking most forward to? I, I got a little birdie said, you're going to get to do some driving. Well, yeah. So when I looked at that question, I was like, can I, do I, am I like stuck to just one answer? Because, <laughs> you know, I could think of, you know, I get to, Coach, uh, you know, a driver, Stephen Thomas in, in, LM, in the IMSA LMP2 this year, who is the, one of the most committed drivers I've ever met in my life next to your son, Colin. Um, and, and, you know, so that's incredible what I get to do there. Uh, um, you know, I get to take a group of drivers to the Nürburgring and Spa in July. And yeah. I think I'm just working this out. Um, I met a person who played at Wimbledon years ago and his wife won the singles championship at Wimbledon and she and Billie Jean King won doubles championships there. And they've arranged for my wife and I to get some uh, uh, center court tickets for Wimbledon Ooh, at some point. Nice. So, and, uh, you know, I might just tie in with a visit to the British Grand Prix. So I may have this really cool trip of British Grand Prix, Wimbledon and Nürburgring and Spa all in one trip in the summer. So got to look forward to that. that. Terrible. Sounds terrible. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm going to drive in like half a dozen or so World Racing League races, WRL races this year. And, you know, I've done a couple, two or three races for the last, you know, each year for the last couple of years. And they were a blast. And that series has become very, very competitive. You know, it used to be that you could show up with an E36 M3 and kind of kick butt. Now you're not even in the top class. And if you're in a GT4 club sport Porsche. I mean, you're not the fastest car on track. You have to be the smartest to win. And it's, you know, it's really tough. And there's some really, really good drivers there. Wow. And I'm having a blast getting a chance to drive some more. So it's going to be a fun That's season. Awesome. I'm looking forward to 22. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, um, yeah. So we knocked out three questions right there. I think that was, uh, that was pretty good. And, and some of them were even ones that people wrote in. We kind of stayed on subject. I'm going to give us a well, passing grade, maybe we'll see how the everybody else thinks. Uh, yeah, we kind of did that. I guess you know we could say, well, <laughs> there's our dumb answers to your smart questions. There's, right? <laughs> yeah, there's at least my dumb answers, and your I think yours are pretty smart. But uh, yeah. we'll go with our dumb, our collective dumb answers to 
to uh, good questions. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the first episode of the No Dumb Questions uh, podcast. And if you have questions for us, uh, send them to us. Jeff, uh, you want to send them to you through your Instagram account? Instagram. Yeah, it's um, I don't have a personal Instagram. I just have my coffee one. So it's Mesa Vista Coffee is the Instagram account. And that's really me. It's more racing than it is coffee. So uh, just shoot them, shoot them there or shoot them to Ross. What's yours, Ross? Mine, my Instagram is just at Ross Bentley or on Facebook at Speed Secret. So if, you, if you've got questions for us, uh, post them, zap them, message us, whatever, and uh, hopefully we'll dig into them. We, we put a message out there you know, a few days ago and we have lots of responses. So we've got a lot of questions, yep. Jeff. Uh, or see us at the racetrack and ask us direct. Oh, even better. Yeah. And, and the only thing, the other thing that we will promise is we have no idea how many of these we're going to do. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's, um, who knows? This could be the last one or we might be, we might be on to do another one. Let's, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Probably won't be the last one. This was pretty much fun. I think we need to do another. Okay. Let's, let's do one more. Okay. I'll at least. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and do another one here. But uh, for now, everybody, thanks for listening. And uh, as I always say, keep learning, having fun. Have fun, everyone. Just uh, that's the that's the point of the whole thing. Just have fun.